Hello and welcome to episode 49 of The Weighing Room, where all three of us are back together this week and we'll be previewing the nine races on Saturday afternoon from Cheltenham, Newbury and Doncaster on ITV with a mixture of jumps and flat racing to get stuck into. And then also we picked out two big jump races on the Sunday uh, that we're going to have a look at from an anti-post angle as well. Frankie, uh, Cheltenham's first meeting of the new season. Uh, how excited are you for the weekend's racing? Yeah, can't wait. It's... Um... I say every year, this is the weekend for me that kickstarts the jump season. You know, the last month, there's a a few kind of, it's a bit of a mix, isn't it? The, the flat's tailing off. You've still got Champions Day in the mix after Chepstow. And I, I never quite know where my head sits. But as of this weekend, it's, well, we are covering some flat racing today. But as of this weekend gone, it's just jumps racing for me. Um, and I, lo I love this meet. It's, for me, it's when all the lads I grew up with and all people I kind of, I've got to know through racing. I'll bump into them and we'll be out for a few drinks and, and dinner and stuff. So, yeah, it's, it, it marks the start of the jumps and, and it's, you know, where where my racing started in Cheltenham. So. Yeah, yeah, it's an unbelievable meeting. Paul, obviously, an ex-jumps jockey. Um, you, you bet you can't wait for this national season to get going, especially uh, at Cheltenham this weekend. Yeah, absolutely, James. Um, you're, you're raring to go, kind of, see. I suppose the showcase meeting does, as Frankie said, it signatures to the proper return. I know we got the Charlie Hall chase on the horizon as well, but this meeting is something that trainers, you're, you're always looking forward to trainers, staff, jockeys alike, the owners, your horses are, everything's a good horse. Every horse is a good horse. They're all working well. They've all been schooling well. Majority of dreams, Bar Hill Crest, all going well. We'll see them, you know, next, back next season. But, you know, dreams are largely still alive at this stage. And, we were talking off air, saying to you, James, like from my experience from riding at Cheltenham, both at this meeting and the November meeting, when the ground is soft, it generally rides a bit kinder at this meeting in that it's fresh ground, it's generally soft, loose ground. In comparison, when you fast forward to the November meeting, if you've got soft ground, having been opened up in October, it generally tends to be drying out a bit and it can ride a little bit tacky in November. So it'll be interesting to see when we get to that stage how, how we find it. But I suppose we're anticipating soft ground ahead of, of this afternoon's and the weekend's action at Presbury Park. Yeah, yeah I'll give you the I'll, I'll give you the view from my bedroom. <laughs> Go on. What we're looking at. <laughs> it's, it's a bit grim. <laughs> this morning, I'm not gonna lie. But yeah. Yeah, a bit of rain. Clouds. What's that? There doesn't look to be much rain in that sky now. At the minute. Oh, there hasn't a, a, a tiny bit overnight. I just I just um was watching the update from Cheltenham's Instagram and I think they said good to firm good in places and only a, a tiny bit of rain this morning so yeah it's, it's amazing yeah. That really, because I know they have been watering at the track um, I just but looking at the weather forecast obviously you can we can only go off what's what's produced online but uh, it does say it's going to rain all pretty much today throughout the afternoon during racing um, and they might get a bit on Saturday so I'm anticipating the, the ground at Cheltenham and, and looking at Newbury and Doncaster, they're going to get some rain. That it, it could be good to soft, maybe soft, depending on how it's gone. But off what Paul says, it might round, it might ride a bit uh, better than usual uh, compared to the other meetings. But we'll have to wait and see. Um, and we'll have a go anyway, won't we? Like, like I mentioned, we're going to dip our toe into the national hunt scene with Cheltenham, offering four live races. We've got Newbury uh, with two races and Doncaster offer three with the feature being the Burton Futurity Stakes, the last group one of the season uh, for the flat. As I mentioned as well, we're going to we're gonna do two races on Sunday with the Grade 2 Old Roan Chase at Aintree and also the Munster National uh, from Limerick, both from an anti-post standpoint, uh, with both events looking fairly tasty from a betting uh, perspective. Right then, we start this week, gents, uh, by looking, uh, we're going to start on the flat, we're going to start with the 150 uh, at Newbury, and it's the Group 3 Virgin Bet Horace Hill Stakes. Um, Paul, we'll start with you this week, uh, who do you like? I've gone with experience here, you know, when you look at the field, striking star has a, a cracking pedigree by Dubawi out of Shamar Del Mare. he won well on debut at Sandown last month. I also like Lord of Biscay, who also opened up his account at the first attempt, that run was at Yarmouth. Caraggio has an obvious chance, but I've gone with the Ralph Beckett trained at Gray's Monument, who was fairly impressive when scoring on his last two starts at Haydock and York. Things didn't quite go to plan. He got himself a little worked up and didn't get quite the run of the race at Doncaster the time before. He's had the benefit of six runs and he comes here in terrific form. So it's Gray's Monument for me. 
Yeah, around the 8-1 uh, mark currently. And like you said, experience could tell it in, in this field with a lot of the horses very unexposed and only having one run, really. So, yeah, Gray's Monument, 8-1, to one, definitely got a beach way shot. Uh, Frankie, who do you like in this? One that Paul mentioned, I think you might be on side with Lord of Biscay. Um, in these races, when we don't know a whole lot, I'm looking for a horse that was both visually impressive and hopefully has beat something of note or that maybe has gone on to win next time out. And Lord of Biscay ticks both those boxes. Very, very impressive to quicken and win like he did at Yarmouth. And then the horse in second that day, Obelix, um, was actually beaten odds on by Lord of Biscay. And then, you know, that was probably justified when he went off one to four next time out and won. So a bit of money floating about for the horse that Lord of Biscay did win. They were three or four lengths clear of third I think um, so I think he's beating a good horse there and he did it quite nicely yeah Lord of Biscay uh, I'm joining you in this one Frank Lord of Biscay has got a cracking chance and at the price is 11 to 2 I think that's that could be quite a good price come um, the end of that race uh, like you said the form um, with that got, I think it's Gosden horse um, he won by 8 that horse went out to win by 8 lengths next time out uh, going off at 1 to 4 they obviously thought a lot of that horse so Lord of Biscay to go and beat that on debut only going to improve um, and also the Varian Yard are absolutely flying. Uh, they landed a group one, didn't they, last week with Bayside Boy, and they're running at a 33% strike rate for the last two weeks. I don't think there's much wrong with going with Lord of uh, Biscay around 11 to 2, Mark, for all the reasons you mentioned and the form um, of the yard at the moment. But it, again, it's one of those races, isn't it, that we don't know a lot about these horses, and they might be uh, better <laughs> off next season, but... Um, Lord of Biscay for me uh, in that one. Right then, we start with Cheltenham's first race uh, on ITV on Saturday. Uh, the 205 888 Sport Watch Your Thinking Handicap Chase over three mile one furlong. Frankie, uh, who did you come down on in this one? Well, it's, a, it's a good one to start off, Cheltenham, isn't it? The Hollow Gins, you have to get excited by a marker 127. Um, second in this race off of 137, I think, last year. Uh, by a nose. I mean, you could argue that seven to two short enough for a horse that pulls up more times than he finishes a race. But <laughs> I mean, he did the same going into this race last year, and he seems to either pull up and, and save it for another day or give it his absolute best effort. And you know that the Twist and Davies will be having a crack at this. They love this meeting. They had a few winners last year around October. They, you know, they always do target the October, November where they can get a win at Cheltenham. That's not the festival. It's not quite as competitive, but they love these sorts of events. Um, having said that, my selection isn't the Hollow Gins. I just thought it's a bit too short for a horse that um, can be hit and miss, but they will be trying for sure. I'm going to go with Captain Catistock, another horse from a yard, Fergal, that likes to get winners at these meetings um, and did very well at that last year. I just like the Cheltenham foreman on good ground. This horse has won twice around Cheltenham. Um, both on good ground. So at the moment, you're looking at good firm. Yes, it will probably rain a little bit, but um, he, he's proven it round here on similar ground and looks a horse that, that could do the same again here. So Captain Catastock would be my selection. Yeah, Captain Catastock around the six to one mark, obviously looking for the hat trick. And like you say, Fergal O'Brien, um, he's absolutely brilliant at this meeting and the November meeting, obviously not far away from Cheltenham, he's stable. So um, yeah, this horse just stays and stays and stays, and has definitely got a big uh, each way chance of six to one. Paul, for yourself in this one? Yeah, I'm siding with Frankie. I like Captain Caddestock. Um, Liam Harrison gets a, a good tune. He's won two on him. He's won on him last time out. That was at Cheltenham back in April. And um, yeah, you'd imagine Fergal should have his, his guns fairly loaded, well loaded for this one. Yeah, I, I, as I said, Captain Caddestock, he's got a great chance, but I'm, I'm taking you on, boys. I'm going with the hollow ginge. Uh, like you said, Frankie's record is patchy, but I cannot get away from that marker 127, especially if the heavens open and he gets the rain that he wants. He's so far below his mark. It, it, it's just, it, he could go and win by streaks, I think. I think it's a really good I don't bet. really know where that mark's come from. I guess being pulled up enough times, but it, it's, got it's a, a drastic drop, isn't it? Oh, it's massive. But this is the, the key piece of form that I think makes this. Um, he's like Hollow Ginge. You, you, you hear his name so much throughout the season, even though pulling up, he's only nine. He's not like he's 10, 11, um, and he's getting a bit older. He still retains his ability at nine years' age. And the key piece of form for him, like I said, is last year he was second in this race behind a really well handicapped Irish runner for Gordon Elliott off a mark of 137. He's 10 pounds below that for this race. 
He's been, he raced off the low 140s, couldn't compete with it. As you said, pulled up, has got a really patchy record. But if you look when he comes to Cheltenham, especially when he gets a bit of soft ground, off 127, I think he's got to go close. Yes, his price is 7-2, to two, probably not the best uh, when you look at his form uh, with so many Ps in there. Um, but I thought if if, it's not, if, if Tully Begg stays in, because I know Tully Begg's... Uh, Double entered for Gordon Elliott with, with, with on a race on the Saturday as well. Captain Catastock, I can see getting backed. The Wolves been backed into eight to one as well. And Corsa Ren um, will love a bit of soft ground as well. So I can see on the day maybe drifting slightly to four to one, maybe getting a bit of nine to two. I'd like to think anyway because that'd be a great price. But I think the Hollow Gin is a really really cracking bet. I think if you look at the um, Tristan Davis horses as well. They're always normally a bit more forward at this time of the year than a lot of others. Like Fergal O'Brien gets his horses ready. Um, but compared to maybe some of the bigger trainers, Twiston Davies gets his horses ready from the offset and especially at this meeting. So um, the hollow gin for me, uh, I think he's got a, a solid chance off that marker, 127. Uh, right then, we go back over to Newbury for their second and final race on Terrestrial TV at the weekend. And he sees another Group 3 with the St. Simon Stakes um, this looks a cracking race um, with the runners that have gone to post uh, for this season's renewal. Uh, we've got Hamish at the top of the market. He's around the four to five favourite at the moment. Um, I think I napped in last time he ran. Um, Paul, who are you with in this one? I think Hamish. I think the market's got a spot on. I think Hamish wins. You know, he was a good winner on his last start. He's won two of his last three. And if he turns up on, on form, Holds his form, he wins. The one I've gone for to follow him home is is Yukon Glenn, who's he's been a bit of a legend for connections. He's a hold up performer. We've got a, a small field here, and I think he can be doing it. Well, he hopefully he will be doing his best work later on under Paul Mulrennan. So Hamish to win, and Yukon Glenn to to follow him home. Yeah, it's tough to get past Hamish, isn't it? If he runs to the same level he has been, um, he's obviously a very solid horse for William Angus and Yukon Glenn. A uh, big price of 20 to 1. He has got a race in him, hasn't he? He has run some great races for the yard over the years, and maybe he can go close in this one. Um, Frankie, are you with the favourite as well? I am, yeah. Can't see him beat, really. It's hard to, it's hard to see him beat um, for the same reasons. The form that he's shown, that should be winning this race. You know, um, winning at Ascot, Chester, second behind Kiprios. I think that's the best there um, around at the moment. Even if you go back to last year in the long distance cup, only True Shannon, Strad, and Tashkan are beating him. There's not the likes of these horses in this race. He should be winning. Yeah, like I said, Hamish got a solid chance. But you know what? I am going to take a little bit of a go at one in this, just because I'm, I like Hamish. I've got, no, I've got no problem with this this horse winning because I think Hamish is a brilliant horse. But I just, one caught my eye around 14 to 1. I thought, you know what? If I play it each way um, and Hamish still does go on and win, I haven't lost anything really in defeat there. Um, and it's Grand Alliance um, for Charlie Fellows. And there's a couple of interesting angles with this horse um, uh, that I'm just going to mention. But he raced for the first time this year uh, in January uh, when he was third at Wolves over one mile, uh, one and a half furlongs in a maiden. He then he then landed a novice stakes over one mile, two furlongs at Chelmsford. And then on handicap debut, he made it back-to-back -back wins uh, at the Doncaster meeting, the Lincoln meeting uh, in March. Um, he... he from then, I think Charlie Fellows went, you know what, we have actually got quite a serious horse on our hands here and we're going to aim it towards the derby. Uh, he ran in the listed uh, Blue Ribbon Derby trial at Epsom. He was only second. Uh, it was only by half a length, I think, to Nahani. Um, but then, obviously, in the derby, it's, it's tough, isn't it, in the derby? Because there were, what, 17 runners there was that day. He only finished 11th. You've got to be a, a really, really smart horse. And obviously, Desert Crown, Westover, uh, they pulled away from the field, didn't they, in the end? So it, it was a bit of a, a nothing race if you didn't get involved. Uh, it was sent to Royal Ascot and then Grand Alliance is probably best race of the season. Came at Royal Ascot when in, in the Group 2, King Edward, the seventh stakes. Uh, and he was a seriously unlucky loser. He should be a Group 2 winner heading into this race. He got there, drifted off a true line and lost by a short head to change in the guard. I'm not sure how he lost that down. I think Charlie, had a, uh, Charlie Fellows must have been pulling his hair out because that was his big chance to land a nice race. Um, he ran no race at, at Glorious Goodwood in the Gordon stakes behind New London. That race has turned out really well. Doville, I think it's Doville Legends come out and, and obviously won. That's going for the Melbourne Cup as well. So it's quite a nice race. It's worked out well. The thing that caught my eye was this horse is that I saw an interview with Charlie Fellows. It was a few, I think it was a few months back. Um, and he said, look, we've decided to geld the horse. And he just mentioned he's going to run once more before the end of the season. 
And if he gets soft ground over one mile four, um, he could have a big chance. So when a trainer says that, my ears pricked up. And when, I, when the price came out 14 to one, I thought, you know what, I'm going to have a go each way uh, and try and get the favourite beat. But as I said, I think Hamish is a solid contender at the top of the market. But a 14 to one with three places on offer with the eight runners, um, I think Grand Alliance is a good each way bet. And, and everything could just come together after that golden operation. So an extremely interesting race at Cheltenham on Saturday is the Matteson Holdings Hurdle for four-year-olds. Features some really talented runners, even though it's a, a small field. Um, Frankie, who are you going with in this one? Tactical, isn't it? Well, I think it is anyway. Um, yeah, so it's an interesting one. I kind of... I, I see this as Pied Piper being the better horse, but he's going to struggle with no good horse to follow. Um you know, look at him in the triumph and he tra travels so well behind Vauban, um, in amongst Phil Dore. Even look at him at Ascot, you know, I think Coltrane won that race. Travels so, so well, this horse, but he doesn't find an awful lot when he hits the front. Not quite as bad, but he reminds me slightly of Abracadabra, another, uh, 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 Abra I can't remember how you say it, but another of Gordon's that just, if you back that in running, you thought you'd already won the race coming to the last and never found a whole lot. He's not that bad, but shows similarities. And I guess the danger is, with not many good horses in here, if they go fairly slow and Paddy Brennan will just be looking to track Pie Piper and make his challenge at the right moment. And if they get into a bit of a fight up the hill, a bit of a sprint up the hill, he might get beat, um, which, so I probably wouldn't have my own cash on him, but I do, I do think he's the better horse out of the two. So I've got, I've got to stick with him. Um, it's just very tactical. And Jack Kennedy's got his work cut out trying to get this horse to win. But I do think Pied Piper's the better horse of the two. So he's going to be my selection. Yeah, it's such a tricky one, isn't it, with these top two in the market? Don't get me wrong, Dr. Parnassus is a nice horse. We don't know much about the Joseph O'Brien one, but it has been backed slightly. And obviously outside the Phil Saw book of 50 to 1, Looks to have no chance, really. Um, I do think it is between the top two in the market. And when uh, I was going through, I think it was Pied Piper 11 to 10 and Night Salute 7 to 4. Night Salute now out to 9 to 4. Could be classed as the value. But I'm with you, Frankie, with, in this one. I just think Pied Piper is the classier horse. Um, I'm looking forward to the rematch be between these two. But obviously, all that went on at Aintree last season, how Pied Piper got beat, I'll never know. But like you say, he's just got that stigma to get to the front and not find too much. I'm hoping having had a good summer off, he's matured slightly. Um, he's also had a run on the flat, hasn't he, at Royal Ascot about 130 days ago. So they obviously knew he was going to come back and start at this point. He should be ready for it. I've got no problem with him with him being ready having had that run at Royal Ascot. And it was a good run actually, finishing sixth yeah. in that Ascot stakes. Um we know all about this horse. We, we know what Pied Piper is about. I just hope that when he gets to the front and he's asked to go and win the race, he finds slightly more than he has done in the past. That is the one key thing here because you know Night Salute's going to battle. You absolutely know that's going to happen. But I'm hoping by that point, Pied Piper might have just absolutely coasted on the bridle too far ahead uh, and go and win the race. So even money, it's a tough one. It's maybe a race probably I'll sit back and just watch um, but putting up a selection for this, I think Pie Piper's the best source in the race. I think he goes and, uh, and goes and wins. Paul, for yourself? I'm with Night Salute. I think it is going to be tactical, but I think if if, if Pied Piper is trotting, I think Night Salute will be walking in behind him. And I think Paddy will challenge as late as possible. Certainly he'll be, he'll be in the wing mirrors uh, approaching the, the final flight, the wings of the final flight. But I think he'll come late and I think he'll he might just you know, play a route that's that's away from he might go away. You know, if Pied Piper opts to come up the stand side rail, I'd imagine Paddy will go as far away, as close to that inside rail as, as possible. So I think Night Salute can out battle Pied Piper here. I think I guess the one that... hope that Pied Pied, Pied Pied Piper the supporters might have is that uh scouting horse just bowls along like they sometimes do. Um I don't know. I, I actually, I know I did have a quick look and that horse seemed to have been held up most times. So that that, that uh, yeah. blunted my confidence a little bit more. Um, so maybe we won't get the pace from that horse. But yeah, it'd be interesting at kind of two out, um, how they're travelling and, and who's in front, that's for sure. I, I think it's a, cracking, it's a cracking race, even though it's a small field. It's really interesting to in the top two. And you can even get Dr. Parnass involved because I think that's a very good horse as well in its own right. I just what even though I think Pied Piper does go and win the race, the value probably does lie with Night Salute now, doesn't it? A nine to four, a seven to four, eleven to ten. It's it's 
it's very close, isn't it? And you can see why Pi Pi was 11 10. Obviously, Gordon Elliott's always going to be top of the market in this uh, against Milton Harris. No disrespect to him, it's just how the market uh, sees it. But nine to four, he, he's, un, he's, he's underestimated probably now uh, and probably looks the value. But it's a cracking race. Um, and, and even though I put Pi Pi up, it's probably one I'll, be, I'll just be sitting and watching just to, for clues um, for later on in the season. Uh, the first event of the afternoon we are covering from Town Moor is the listed Doncaster Stakes over six furlongs, and it features quite a classy field for this Renault pool. Yeah, I've gone with Aesop's Fables, who was no match for, for Sheldon at Newmarket last time out. That was in the Dewhurst. Aesop's Fables also found life a bit tough in the Group 1 National Stakes at the Curra last month, but ran out a ready winner of the Group 2 Futurity Stakes at the Curra. That was back in August. And I think Aesop's Fables can capitalise on the drop down in grade and lead them home in this one. Yeah, Aesop's Fables, six to five favourite. Um, has drifted slightly because he was about 10 to 11. But look, he's the class horse in the race. He's definitely got a big chance, uh, Frankie. Yeah, I agree. The, the soft ground was putting me off a bit. Um, maybe, oh, well, that's why I've tried to find an each way angle that, you know, if it comes second and I get some each way money then so be it. Um, Aesop's Fable is probably the most likely winner. And, and as Paul said, a drop down in class should should be the difference. But I just didn't like the soft ground and the, the very short price. It was making me nervous. So <laughs> Hispanics, my selection. Um, really like the way this course quickened and went clear over five. To do that over five furlongs and to put such a gap between um, himself and second over five and on soft ground that day. Um, I quite like that race. So Hispanic each way would be my selection, but Aesop's Fables, as Paul said, a likely winner in, in this field. Yeah, I was of the similar opinion, Frankie, maybe at a different angle, but I, w I, I, I respect Aesop's Fables. I was happy to take him on because of that soft ground. Um, even though he's got all the form in the book at seven, look, he'd be running in the Dewhurst behind those horses and maybe not to the best effects, but to be put into those races, O'Brien must think he's a, a decent enough horse. Um, but I just thought with Bresson and Hispanic um, running against the favourite, I was happy to take him on. And I have come down on Bresson uh, for Jonathan A.D. Godden, uh, Gosden. And he's, he's quite, look, he's quite an exciting horse uh, he, by not doing too much, if you know what I mean. His pedigree suggests he's going to be a lot better uh, than what he is. And he, he just I just feel the pennies dropping in his last few runs. And I just think he, he can go on and go close in this raid. He made his debut uh, in May over six furlongs at Newbury behind Sydney Arms. Chelsea obviously went over to France and won a nice race there. Um, second again after that, behind bumping into Victory Dance. This horse has just bumped into some nice horses. Victory Dance, obviously a nice horse. Um, and that was on a step up to seven furlongs. Placed again on his third run. And um, that was behind Tarja and Dancing Magic. Both decent horses in their own right as well. But drop, drop down. I think six furlongs is uh, Bresson's um, trip. I really do. And he was dropped there, dropped down to that, sorry, two starts ago. Um, and he, he just put in a, a serious, serious performance um, to win at Yarmouth. And then he was last seen at Salisbury when he gave almost a stone away to the winner, Remarque, uh, on and that was on debut. Look, giving a stone away. That was good soft ground. He ran no, he ran fine in that. Being out of shirt of speed uh, and a, a son of Dabawi, they both, you look back at their form, they both won on soft ground. I've got no problem with that. He might just improve for a bit of soft conditions. You never know. I think Bresson at five to one was an each way bet to nothing against the favourite. But I do respect Hispanic uh, as six to one as well because that was a serious performance last time out, wasn't it? So I, I, I am I am against the favourite, even though I think he's the most likely winner. I was just at the prices. I was happy uh, to play uh, against him with, with a, an each way bet to nothing. So back over to the jumps then uh, at Jumps Racing HQ, and next up is the eight eight Sport uh, Class Two Handicap Chase over two miles, and you see some familiar faces, Frankie from last season coming back and making their seasonal return. Who do you like? Yeah, I'm going to go with the, the Irish Raider. Willie Mullins' dad's lad, I think, could just be well handicapped. Um, was last seen in a hurdle race at Listowel behind some fairly quick horses. Um, and hasn't had a whole lot of chasing experience. Only the three starts. The first was a bit untidy and um, ended up coming fifth after clattering a few. But since then, it's won both of his um, chase races and, and jumped nicely and won quite nicely. I just... 
think this horse is coming in off a mark of 135. has got to be a bit better than that. Um, Editor De Geet, popular around Cheltenham. Um, and, you know, the, the class angle in the race, I'd be probably most fearful of him. But at the weight, that's what's attracting me to um, Dad's lad. Yeah, Willie Mullins. Um, he hasn't bought many over for this for this meeting, so you've got to, your ears have got to prick up, haven't they? When when he has a runner, uh, and and Daz lads, he is interesting off his handicap mark. Uh, Paul, for yourself in this one, I think it's going to be interesting to see how the Widowmaker fares for trainer Joe Tizard. He was well held in a Grade One at entry on his final start last season in a race won by Miller's Bank. He ran well to finish second in a small field, albeit at Chepstow before that, and prior to that. He made a winning chase and debut at Exeter. That was back in February. Um, he won first him out last season, so fitness shouldn't be an issue. And I think the, the Widowmaker should give it a good account of himself here under Brendan Powell. Yeah, the Widowmaker around the 8-1 to one mark. I think ran uh, in that manifesto and obviously chased in the Aintree. Uh, and, we right. saw, and we saw a bit of what, of what that horse is about. So, yeah, it could go well around the 8-1 to one mark. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going... Um, with one you mentioned, Frankie, editor de Jeet. Um, I think this horse is a class above the field, personally. I know he's giving way all around, but he loves it at Cheltenham. He doesn't mind what ground. He'll bounce out from the front, and I think he'll get the lead and say, come and catch me, and I don't think anyone will. Um, if you look at what he's done over the last few seasons, he's progressed and progressed and progressed. Like, at the back end of the 2021 season, at entry, he won the big fieldy grade three red room handicap chase. That was off a mark of one three two. Uh, he went up in the handicap all the way throughout last season, but he was still progressive. And he, he unseated on um, seasonal debut last term. But apart from that, he went to Cheltenham in November, landed a handicap chase from the front over two miles off a mark of 140. Made it back to back wins at the December meeting, uh, and that was off seven pound higher. And he then went to the festival and ran an absolute cracker in the grand annual to finish fourth. That was heavy ground that day. And it looked like he was going to tire out, but he, he go, went all the way to the line, again going from the front, and it was just found a, a, a few too good for him that day. He was pulled up at Aintree, was tried in grade one company because his mark had gone up. Um, it didn't work out. He's now back into calmer waters. He's so versatile when it comes to ground, but you know exactly what he's going to do. He's going to bounce out from the front. I thought Editor De Gia around the 72 mark was solid in this race. And although top weight off a mark of 153, he hasn't got... He, he, look... He can't go anywhere else after this apart from going to having to go into higher class because his mark will be too high if he wins this race. But I, I just thought first time out, um, he's got a massive chance. I just I just don't think they'll catch him. I really, really don't. And uh, at 72, he's got a big, uh, big, big chance. So the feature event of the afternoon on the flat uh, from Doncaster, it's the last uh, group one of the British flat season. It's the Verton Futurity Trophy Stakes for the two-year-olds. Um, I'll read you through the odds here, Paul. We've got Eight runners that go to post uh, for this race. And we start at the top of the market with a 10 to 11 favourite, August Rodin for Aidan O'Brien. He's got a great record in this race. Obviously won it um, last year with Luxembourg. Uh, Epictatus, a horse we like, Paul, that we tipped up last time uh, around four to one. Holloway Boy, obviously the Cheshire win at nine to one. Stormbuster was a nice winner last time out, 11 to one. King of Steel, really interesting for David Lochnane. 12 to 1, um, winner on debut just 10 days ago. And then you've got others 16 to 1 bar, Salt Lake City, Dancing Magic, and Captain Versbar. Um, Paul, who are you going with in this one? I'm going to stick with Epic Taylor's. I think the favourite favorite should be suited here by uh, Don Castle. Like, was it was a good winner at Leprosan in a, a group two contest last time out? And Leprosan wouldn't be a bit stiffer of a finish but it wouldn't be that dissimilar to, to Doncaster it's a, a good big galloping track so the favourite as the betting reflects should go close but I'm going to give Epic Taters another chance he was a good winner on debut at Newmarket that was back in July Martin Harley was on board on that occasion which would indicate that he wasn't he wasn't totally he might have been pleasing connections but he might have been just setting the world alight at home Frankie was on board last time out when he was just caught by Silver Knot that was in the autumn stakes at the beginning of the month. And I think, I certainly think Epictetus can get closer to the favourite, if not getting ahead of him, than the, the betting suggests here. So it's Epictetus for me. Yeah, um, I'm on the same wavelength here, Paul, for the exactly the reason you've just said. Um, I, 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 do you know what? I'd even go as far to say that I actually think Epictetus' last run in the Group 3 autumn stakes might be slightly better form than the, the in the group race that... Um, uh, the favourite running. 
If you actually look how Caroline Street, the finished second, came and ran last time out, we absolutely blew up. No good. We haven't really seen much apart from that. But I just think Silver Knot was solid, took that horse all the way to the line. If none the worse for the quick turnaround, uh, look, the favourite has had another, what, 30 days to get ready for this race. And you do know that, I know Brian has targeted this race in the past, and this probably was the horse on the start of the season to go with. But a 10 to 11, an epic taste of 4 to 1, I was happy to take the favourite on. And I, I do think um, the Jonathan Thady Gosnells will go close with Frankie uh, on board. Um, who do you like, um, Frankie, in this one? Run against you. I'm sticking with the shorty. Um, just keeping it simple. Aidan O'Brien knows how to win this race. The horse won last time out on soft ground. Um, in that group too it just looks a solid bet and as you said they've got a bit of a quick turnaround epic it's on Holloway Boy it's a bit of a shame I would, I would have had a stab at Holloway Boy each way if it wasn't so off ground um, slightly better ground didn't get the best of runs and probably haven't seen the best of Holloway Boy there and maybe that's why they thought to come over, to come here and have a go but with the soft ground it, that kind of put me off so August Roden um just looks the the obvious answer for me here and I'm, I'm not willing to take him on yeah no problem in that uh, like you said I know Brian he, he, look, he absolutely loves this race and it, we could all me and Paul could at the end of the day be going well we knew that was going to happen didn't we but we want to go and try, we want to try and take it on um, with Epic Taters so Cheltenham's final event of the afternoon on ITV uh, is the Class 2 Potemps Network handicap hurdle over three miles uh, this looks a really tricky event, I think. Um, and one of the reasons why I think it's tricky is because it's a qualifier for the festival event. Um, and we always know with a lot of horses that they're just trying to trundle around, getting the, t I think it's the top four this season. They've changed it this season, getting the top four and they don't actually try and win the race. So it makes it even harder to call when, but when you're actually trying to look for the winner of this race, uh, Frankie, who did you uh, land on in the end? Yeah, I'll give you two at the opposite end of the yeah. ends of what you said. Um, Salvador Ziggy, since switched to the Elliott Yard, four from four, getting better with every race, getting better the further he goes. Looks like a proper staying hurdler. But as you, you said, it it would be um, very Gordon Elliott-like to go and sit this one in third or fourth. <laughs> you can play each way. Um, I'm seeing around about sevens. Um, I think he, he looks a very good horse in the making. Whether or not he goes and wins, who knows. But he'll he would be there in the mixer at the end. And if you can get an each way price, then I think that would be worth playing personally. One that will be trying, um, try as hard as it can down at 25s. Ask Dylan what a legend this horse is. Um, Mark, who owns it, lives in Cheltenham actually, a mate of mine. We owns it with a few others. He's an absolute character. And no doubt. No doubt. And that will be part. Partly why he's running. Um, but he'd be trying. This horse stays and stays pretty abysmal. Um, but that's when he's at kind of your class one, two, class one level, your, your grade one, two, three level. When he just drops down, he actually goes all right. And as I said, this horse will be off the bridle four, five out and will still stay. So he'll give it a good crack, Austin. And then at 25s, might finish out the back of telly, but you might, you might have something to shout about coming over the last. Yeah, that's Dylan. Like you said, he's an absolute warrior for the yard and the course and distance winner as well. So doesn't mind it around Cheltenham. And yeah, at the top of the market, well, near the top of the market, um, the Gordon Elliott horse, in very, very interesting runner. Uh, I'm looking forward to see how that goes. But he's going off what top weight. Um, and we'll just have to see how that, that gets on. Paul, um, who did you come down on this one? It's a tricky one, isn't it? It is very. Um, and it's on Talior who gets the, the tentative nod here. He's one that likes to be dropped in. I think the faster the go, the better for him. There should be plenty of pace on in this. Ontario got no further than the first hurdle on his previous visit to Cheltenham. That was at the November meeting last season. He was a nice winner of a competitive handicap at Haydock back in April. He was second. Wasn't beaten all that far, but albeit a beaten favourite when finishing second at Cartmel last time out. I'd forgive him that second place effort on that. Cartmel is not the easiest of tracks to ride on one that likes to be dropped in. And I think Antalya, I think the race should be run to suit and should be there or thereabouts. Yeah, Antalya is a solid horse uh, for John Joe O'Neill over the last few seasons. Um, and around nine to one is a big each way player. I've also played two against the field in this one uh, and they are tentative uh, nods because they're around the 16, 14 to one marks. First one is Silver Sheen. Um, 
An ex Jessica Harrington uh, horse now handled by Fergal O'Brien. Um, off a marker one three two. I just thought this gelding could be dangerous on on, on soft ground. Um, been up and down over the last few years for Jessica Harrington, this horse, and does need to bounce back. I think a few horses in this race do need to bounce back, but two starts ago and second at Fairy House in a big field, the handicap, um, that was probably one of his best efforts for a long, long time. If regaining that form, I thought Silver Sheen can go really close. He's also a winner over further on soft ground in England before in his career at Warwick. Uh, he'll certainly stay the trip. And you never know. He might. He, he what two seasons ago he was targeted at this race, but didn't actually get get in and but was able to race. You don't know this season that they might be targeting again. And like you say, he could just run around and try and get it into fourth. But for, knowing Fergal O'Brien and how he trains his horses, um, you like to think they they try their best in every race. And I just think Silver Sheen could go close in this race. Another one that was really interesting at slightly higher odds around the sixteen to one mark was the Real Wacker uh, for Anne Duffield. Uh, this is a lesser known horse and hasn't. He's, he's probably one of the most unexpo uh, unexposed horse in the field that could play to his strengths. With a lot of these horses having loads of runs throughout their career, um, but I, I, and it was another one from a mark standpoint that I just thought it could be interesting. Of one three seven because we, I don't think he's reached the the height of how good this horse could be. Uh, seen only two times for this yard uh, during his short career. Last season, he got off the mark on yard debut at Carlisle when Bolton up in a maiden over three mile, one furlong. And uh, then last time out of Doncaster, he was actually seen in the grade two River Don Novice's hurdle. And he was second to quite a nice type for John McConnell. Um, very likely race, bundles of potential um, over the staying trip. And having form on that soft ground, I thought he was worth taking a chance uh, on, on that soft ground. I just thought he was worth taking a chance. One I do want to mention though, um, he's the one at the top of the market. He's Botox has. Uh, I'm not putting him up, but Paul, I might ask you on this. Botox has has only gone up a pound uh, for winning a grade two last time out. Where does that come from? I'm not sure. I don't know how the handicappers assess that. He's, he's usually fairly, fairly sharp at putting them up and not as not as quick to to drop them. So I'm not quite sure what the the theory is behind that, James. I, I think, he, look, he could be a handicap block that off 140, and a pound higher from winning the grade two at Fontwell. If you look, Bruin Storm in behind, Guard Your Dreams, Mon Morale, Darva Star, All Mankind. They're serious horses. So to be yeah. off 140 in a handicap, that could you can see why he's six to one mm -hmm. favourite. Absolutely. And and Darva Star has come out. He's been absolutely flying. I think he, he's jumped his way into to Hatton's Grace contention. Certainly, to I know Honeysuckle is going to be the one to have to beat in Hatton's Grace, but. I know connections are quite sweet about taking Honeysuckle on in the Hatton's Grace with Darva Star following his last time out success. So, yeah, it's it, it's interesting. Yeah, he, I just I just thought that was worth mentioning because it, even at six to one, it could even be an each way bet, couldn't it? Um, with with, with that mark of one forty. But yeah, I, I am two against the field in this one, and and it is a race where you, there would be plenty of places on offer, so it's worth having a stab at a bigger prize, isn't it? Um, Saturday's racing on ITV finishes from Doncaster in the Class 2 at the races uh, at Form Study Handicap. Another tricky event on the day. Uh, Paul, round off our Saturday selections for us. Yeah, I've gone with, well, I think if, if Kim and Grace turns up in the same form as she did at York at the beginning of the month, I think she'll be tough to beat, despite the, the £5 rise from the handicap or for that success. Neil Callum was on board on that occasion. Ryan Moore takes them out here for Richard Hughes. And I think King and Kim and Grace will be tough to beat. Yeah, Kim and Grace near the top of the market. Definitely uh, got a got a big chance in this one. Frankie, um, who do you like? Name from the dark. Safi Osborne rides. Um, a suitable name as well, given this horse's form. Eight of ten last time out. Ten of ten the time before. Ten of twelve the time before. Um, so on bare form, he might be put off slightly, but they were in some better races. Um, and actually, last time out was after a 133-day break and wind surgery. And although 8 of 10 was only three lengths behind the winner, so it looks worse than it is on numbers. Um, and I think this horse has got a little bit of improvement and coming now into a handicap um, off a mark of... What was it rated? 102. Um, I think has to have a chance in this field. Like I said, running in better races hasn't, or has the numbers don't justify what this horse has done and, and could, could, could go closer. Yeah, 
came from the dark for me as well, around the seven to one mark. And you know what? How many times on this pod have I said this last chance saloon and they've turned up and won? So, and I'm going to say it again. Came from the dark. This is the last chance saloon. I did it with one East. Uh, that was the most recent one. Obviously, that went on to win at 14s. This is a nice price at seven to one. I've tipped this on every run this season and it's blew out. But now in a handicap, Safi Osborne taking off three. So basically running off a mark of 99. So much, much, uh, much more calmer waters this race than what he's been running in for the last two years, probably. Uh, and obviously, at the at the back end of last season, we're in a group three, uh, beating horses like Happy Romance and Arecibo. If retaining that form off a mark of 99, I think this horse at seven to one is a huge price. Look, you, you can see why the bookies have put him up at seven to one because of the form he has in his last three runs. But this race is so much more easier, even off top, off top weight. Uh, than the horse he's been running against. So I thought came from the dark was quite a good bet on Saturday, uh, uh, Doncaster. And like I said, with Safi Osborne taking that three off, she's had a great season, hasn't she? Especially with the racing league. She was brilliant um, in that. So hopefully she can get this horse home um, for Ed Walker. Um, right then, lads, as we mentioned at the top of the top of the show, this week we've picked out two standout races on Sunday to have a look at, with obviously the jumps coming back. Um, we've got to get stuck into this. And uh, they are from Antipost. Uh, angles because we are filming uh, uh, where well, we started filming at eight o'clock on Friday morning, so we actually don't know what horses are running yet. But we're gonna have a go anyway. Um, and the first race we're gonna cover is from Aintree, it's their feature race, it's the grade two old Roan handicap chase. Uh, Frankie, this looks uh, quite a smart race if they all turn up, don't they? Yeah, it does. Looks, uh, looks a good race to be honest. One I'm excited, um, to watch. I'm going with Miller's Bank here. Um, Solid bit of entry form. Finished his hurdling career um, in the entry hurdle, coming third. And then since, uh, won his first chase start, unseated, unseated in two decent races. Went, went going decent enough. And then second behind Pick Dory, you know, I was a big fan of that horse last year. Just absolutely tanks along. Um, and then managed to reverse that form with Pick Dory at entry. Um, winning before signing off at Punchestown. A bit disappointed, but that was over three miles. Back to entry, back to two and a half. Um, looks a solid bet for me, Miller's Bank. I think it should go well here. Yeah, Miller's Bank around five to one, um, jocked up as well. So, uh, should be running, uh, yeah, course and distance winner. Got a really big chance. Paul, for yourself, I think on his best form, if he turns up and on the ratings, Hitman, I think, should should almost carry these. I think, unless he underperforms or what have you, I think he should get the job done. And I, I was seeing five to two last night, and I think could look a bit generous shortly after 2 40 on Sunday afternoon. Yeah, you can even get 11 to 4 now. So, um, yeah, yeah, Hitman's definitely got a, a big chance if turning up. I love this. I love the way we've gone in this race because we all quite fancy our horses and I've gone for a different one as well. So, um, do your job for me, um, for Michael Scudamore. Um, I, I, I think this horse has got an absolute massive chance. It was 11 to 2 in the week and now looking in the market around 4 to 1. Uh, could even get shorter around 7 to 2 uh, looking at some of the, the bookies. But uh, it was a smart novice hurdler for Michael Scudamore in the 2021 season. Um, winning two of his seven starts while placing another four is just a really solid, um, really solid contender. His standout efforts in that season was when he was second to my Droger at Kelso in the grade two Premier Novices Hurdle. Um, and then he finished his stint uh, over hurdles at Aintree when second to Belfast Banter in the grade one top novices hurdle. So the Aintree forms there. Uh, sent chasing last term. He got off the mark at first time of asking at Warwick. Um, he then he then got over a fall um, to fit and then finished second uh, at Kempton over Christmas behind Edwardstone. Obviously, we saw what Edwardstone did last season when and won the Arkle, and that was in the grade two wayward lad and obviously his chase. It's in three more times last season. He was second um, of three in the grade two novices, uh, novices chase at Doncaster, lightly novices chase at Doncaster. But then back that up um, with back-to-back wins at Newcastle and Air with his last run, seeing him take the grade two future champion novice chase at Air. Coming out of novice company, obviously into this race off a mark of 146, having won on his opening run for the last two seasons. I thought do your job was solid at four to one. Um, and it, it, I, I just re- like, it was just that thing that winning his first two races, the last few seasons, he's going to be absolutely stripped brilliant for this race. Um, and I think he's got a big chance. So that's do your job. Uh, the final event, lads, we're going to cover on this week's pod. Um, comes from Limerick on Sunday with the big field in Munster National, over three miles. Always a tricky event, but it offers some nice each way value at this stage. Paul, 
Uh, we'll give you the honour in this race. Who do you like? I've gone with the Eric McNamara trained Donkey Years for owner JP McManus. Donkey Years was well beaten when finishing ninth of 11 at Listowel last month. However, he finished off last season with a, a fine victory at Punchestown back in April. And I think with the benefit of that recent run, I think Donkey Years can go close in this one. Yeah, I, I, I came down on the same horse for exactly the same reasons. I thought that run last time out was a pipe opener to strip him absolutely ready for this race. Having um, having the form from the punch, uh, that Punchestown win, that was off a marker one two eight, and obviously beat a nice horse of Willie Mullins in Recite a Prayer that day. Um, I thought this might have been one of his very early targets and quite a big target because it's a nice race to win the Munster National um, and yeah, donkey is for me uh, uh, as well. I thought I had a big chance off a marker one three four. Uh, Frankie finishes off, mate. All these horses. Guess who trains my selection? <laughs> um, go on. Who is it? Joseph O'Brien. <laughs> of course, it is. <laughs> Early doors will be mine. Um, one that's just been dipping in and out of different. Um distances and between hurdles and chasing and potentially could be the world handicap. If you pick out his chase form um, at, at around three miles or more off a mark near of one for eight, which he runs off, it's decent enough. But you've got to pick through, as I said, a few hurdle races, a few uh, uh, races around two miles where he's been disappointing. But chasing over a staying trip, um, off a 148 and maybe that mark's been slightly kept down by the fact that he has been dipping in and out of various um, types of races so yeah early doors for me um, will be my selection yep yeah, early doors um, around the 11 to 1 mark and, and a Cheltenham Festival winner um, so uh, got a big chance if turning up um, lads that's it for this week um, a lot of I think eleven races covered there, so we've we've been through the cards on Saturday and Sunday. Um, you know what time it is now. I'm going to ask you for your nap, please, of the weekend. And um, Frankie, you can kick us off this week. Oh, so all these the more horses we go through, I think the harder it is to to come down on a nap. <sighs> I don't want to give a Sunday one. I'm gonna, you know what? I'm gonna go with uh, Fergals at Cheltenham. To beat Hollow Ginge, um, even off that low mark, Captain Catterstock. Fergal will have him fired up. He's done it by Enchantment before. Um, if the ground is good, even better for me. And if you can play an each way price, then happy days. Yeah, Captain Catterstock, six to one. And you know what? I was going to dip my toe into that, but I'll, I'll, let, I'll let you have that race. I'll let you have that race. So, <laughs> Paul, yourself? I think Aesop's Fables will win the three o'clock at Doncaster on Saturday afternoon. Dropping in grade, I think, should be the, the one they all have to beat. And sure, I can't leave without giving one for the dog <laughs> from this evening. <laughs> hey, you won last time, didn't you? When I was there, I yeah, actually had a few quid on it. So I uh, paid for a few beers. <laughs> a couple of quiet weeks, and then I put up two on the last pod, and, and geez, they, they both of them won. So yeah, they yeah, it wasn't too bad. Um, so no, yeah, we'll see if Lightning can strike twice. Um, I'm going to go with the feature race, the 730 is the Albasi Equi World, Dubai, Pat Small and Mercury Stakes. I quite like Harry's bar for Aidan McGuinness and Ronan Whelan. He's got a cracking record at the track and I think he should go well from stall seven. So that's Harry's bar in the 730 at Dundalk. Uh, I tell you what, I reckon some people just skip to the end of this podcast just for, <laughs> for all Dundalk tips because it's brilliant uh, every week. So yeah, no, we love that from yourself uh, with the two. Um I was looking at the hollow gins, but I'll let you have that race. I'm going to go for one on Sunday. I'm going to go in the old Roan. I'm going to go with Do Your Job uh, around the four to one mark. I think a solid record first time out. He's got the form in the book from last season. Uh, and I'm, I am happy to take on Hitman uh, and Miller's Bank. It'd be a really good race, but I, I, I'm quite solid on this one. I think he's got a big chance. Um, thanks as always, lads, uh, for your selections. We've been through a lot there and put up a fair few horses. So hopefully we found some winners across Saturday and Sunday. The jumps... Um, he's well and truly back uh, with Chant on this weekend. So please be sure to like this video, comment your selections below for the weekend, uh, for all the race we've covered or anything else you have, any next job for the weekend, and subscribe to the Wizard Closure channel with plenty of content on there. We have our five jump sources to follow um, that we recorded recently. Also, Harry Skelton's um, stable tour on there. We had a chat with him about uh, all things... Um, jump season so yeah plenty of content to get stuck into uh, and all the best of the weekend where everyone everyone is back in and thanks again lads